Yeah, it's also nice, it's also a good opportunity to and talk about this history and significance of the Ramagama stupa. And <coughs> yeah, we, <coughs> it's not so well known um, as a holy site. Most people know about Gaia and Kusinara and so on. So yeah, after the Buddha had entered final Liban in Kusinara and his body had been cremated, then the news about his final Libana was spreading in India. And the Sakyans, the Kapilavatu, the own clan of the Buddha, they heard that the Buddha passed away and they sent a messenger to Kusinara. So they said, they said uh, the Blessed One was the highest of our relatives and we are worthy to receive a portion of the relics of the Buddha and we will build a great stupa for him. <coughs> and similar King Ajatasattu hears that the Buddha passed away and also sends a messenger and saying the Buddha was a Katya and I'm a Katya. So it's from the same clan and I'm worthy to receive a share of the relics of the Buddha. And I build a great stupa for him. And similar the Lichavis of Vesali and other groups request a portion of the relics of the Buddha. And also the Koliens of Ramagama sent a messenger that we are Katyas and the Buddha was a Katya. We are worthy to receive a share of the relics of the Buddha. And Queen Maya, the mother of the Buddha, was a Kolian princess. So it's understandable that they asked for a share of the relics of the Buddha as well. So there were some relatives and connected because the mother from the Buddha came from that clan. Yeah, so then all these messengers arriving at Kusinara where the Buddha passed away and asking for some portion of the relics of the Buddha. But the local clan, the Malas of Kusinara, they don't want to give away any of the relics. They, they say, um, the Buddha passed away on our territory, so we don't give away any of the relics, we just keep it for ourselves. <laughs> and um, they are then at that time uh, a Brahmin, who is a disciple of the Buddha, is also present, and his name is Dona. And then he he tries to um, find a solution and sort of addressing the different groups with a short verse or teaching. And so he says, "Listen, sirs, to my proposal. For parents is the teaching of the Buddha. It is not right that conflict should arise." from sharing out the relics of the highest person. Let all be joined in harmony and peace, in friendship sharing out each portion of the relics. Let stupas, be, let stupas be built in all directions, that all may see and gain confidence in the seeing one, the Buddha. So he's yeah. encouraging them that they actually share the relics and not keep everything for themselves. And so then the, the people say, well, Brahmin, then <coughs> you should divide up the relics in the best and fairest way. And so the, the Brahmin Dona agrees and divides the relics up in eight portions. And then yeah, after the relics have been distributed, the Brahmin asks for the urn where the relics of the Buddha have been um, kept. And so he um, says, please give me the urn, I will build a great stupa for it. So he wants to build a stupa for the urn as well. And so they give the urn to the Brahmin. And soon afterwards, a ninth group of people comes there, called the Moriyas of people Lavana. <coughs> they also send a messenger and request a portion of the relics but then at that time the relics have already been distributed. So they are told yeah, they have already been divided up, but they can have some of the ashes from the funeral pyre. And so they take some of the ashes and build a stupa for the 
for the ashes as well. <coughs> yeah, and then the, the different groups build stupa for their share of relics. So King Ashatasatu builds a great stupa in Rajagaha for the relics of the Buddha, and the Sakyans build a stupa in Kapilavatu, and the Lichavis in Visali, and the Kolians in Ramagama. Um, yeah, and so this is how the first eight Buddhist stupas, relic stupas, were built about 400 BC, so 2,400 years ago. Mm. This is the account from the Mahaparinibhala Sutta from Diganikaya 16. Yeah, of describing the last year of the life of the Buddha. It's also nice or worthwhile read of seeing the last teachings and encouragement of the Buddha that he gave to us. And then 200 years later, um, King Asoka became a follower of the Buddha and decided to build many stupas in his whole kingdom. And for that purpose, he opened seven of the eight original relic stupas and took most of the relics and distributed them to the new stupas that they built in his whole kingdom. However, when King Asoka went to the relic stupa in Ramagama, um, a king of the Nagas prevents him from opening the stupa and taking the relics. And so Nagas, these divine beings of the lowest heavenly realms, serpent or dragon-like spirits that usually they're living in the water, in rivers or lakes or ocean. And so, yeah, Nagas are also said to protect treasures or precious objects. In this case, the, this king of the Nagas is protecting the stupas with the relics of the Buddha, which has yeah, been undisturbed. And yeah, the, the Naga king shows King Asoka the offerings that the divine beings make to the stupa. And he tells the king, if he can surpass the splendor of the offerings and the worship of the devas, he can have some of the relics. But not, obviously the, the human king, King Asoka, is not able to surpass the offering of the devas. So he has to leave again without any relics from the stupa and the stupa remains undisturbed. Yeah, the scene of King Asoka visiting the Ramagama stupa was already engraved on the Sanchi stupa around 150 BC. So it's, you can already see in the Sanchi stupa in India they engraved some scenes from the life of the Buddha and other things and so it's a little scene where King Asoka visiting the Ramagama stupa. And later, about 1,600 years ago, 1,400 years ago, then some early Chinese pilgrims came to India to visit the holy sites there. The name of Fa Xian and Huin Sang, and they visited the Ramagama stupa. But they already described the stupa as more or less abandoned. So already at that time, yeah, one can see that it was probably forgotten more or less about 1,500 years ago already. And then, yeah, until British archaeologists started to get interested in the history of India. And um, so then only in 1900s, the first of these eight relic stupas was discovered. The stupa by the Buddha's own relatives, the Sakyans, in Kapilavatu. The Vedic Quarry even has an inscription on it. So it says, it's an inscription in Brahmi script, and it says, This casket of the relics of the Blessed One, the Buddha of the Sakyans, is the gift of the brothers Sukirti, together with their sisters, sons, and wives. So the whole family sort of offered this urn with the, <laughs> with the relics of the, in the stupa in there. Yes. <laughs> 
and some of these relics are on display in the National Museum in India, in New Delhi. And some were shared with other Buddhist countries, with Thailand and Burma and Sri Lanka. And also two of our branch monasteries, they have some relics from the stupa of the Sakyans. One in Wat Pananachat, there is a pyramid-shaped old depositor hall, and on the top is like a little golden spire with a stupa. And there are some of the relics of the of the Sakyans from the stupa, and also in Wat Ratanavan. And then later, in 1958, archaeologists discovered the stupa of the Lichavis in Vesali. And also there are the Sveli caskets in, in a museum in Patna. Yeah, then in 1974, archaeologists suspected that they found the Ramagama stupa a few thousand kilometers away from Lumbini, just like a seven meter high hill covered by grass. And um, the, these travel accounts of the early Chinese pilgrims, they were very precise, so they, they kept, like a, they, they wrote a very de detailed description where they were traveling. So they then describe, okay, from Lumbini we went 25 kilometers northeast, and then we arrived there, and so on. So we can even, based on these accounts, then the archaeologists were able to find these various holy sites that we um, know now in India. And so, not so long ago, just 25 years ago, they made the first geophysical survey of the area and excavated around some found some small monastery there and yeah and sort of confirmed that that was the this is the Ramagama stupa described in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta and so the Ramagama stupa is one of the eight oldest Buddhist stupas in the world dating from 400 BC it's also the only one of these eight original stupas from the time of the Buddha that survived undisturbed. So the Ramagama stupa is a sort of a unique Buddhist holy site. It's the only stupa that survived from that time. Then about eight years ago I was on pilgrimage in Lumbini in India and Nepal. And then it's not far away from the Ramagama stupa. And then I thought, if ever some influential person asks me about advice for a big stupa project, then I would recommend him to develop the Ramagama stupa as a holy site because of its great significance. And, yeah, and so recently, what I was hoping for happened. Some Singaporeans developed. Mm, um, they founded a trust to develop the Ramagama stupa as a holy site. Um, yeah, so they will work together with the trust to develop Lumbini, the birthplace of the Buddha. And yeah, I think Lumbini yeah, is a very nice holy site. It's in terms of the external development, I think it's one of the nicest holy sites in India and in, in Nepal. And I think they really made the best out of it, how this environment is like around it. They made a whole like, nice area surrounding the holy site. So I hope they can do something similar with the Ramagama stupa as well. Yeah, it's um, obviously a nice thing to do, developing and reviving a Buddhist holy site. It can be have impact on millions of people over centuries and even millennia. So it's obviously a powerful good karma. And just another example from the past. But all of you know Bodhgaya, the place where the Buddha attained awakening. 
but 130 years ago, Bodhgaya was just a ruin, overgrown, and most people didn't know anything about the significance of Bodhgaya, why it is important. But then some Sri Lankan um, Dhamma practitioner, Anagarika Dhammapala, he visited Bodhgaya and saw they neglected the Vedic temple. And then when he bowed to the Vajrasana, at which marks the place where the Buddha attained awakening, then he had this aspiration that arose in his mind and he wanted to dedicate his life to revive Bodhgaya and the Buddhist holy sites in India. And so, yeah, today Bodhgaya is the most important Buddhist holy site in the world and every year several million people come there to pay respects and chant and meditate, recollect the Buddha. Yeah, and similar like Bodhgaya 130 years ago, now the Ramagama Stupa is just a, a little hill and, and most people don't know anything about its significance. Um, yeah, but if the Ramagama Stupa gets developed as a holy site again, then and people will visit, pay respects to the relics of the Buddha, so recollect him, meditate and chant there. The, the Pali word for stupa is tupo, and it means a heap or mound. So originally, 2,500 years ago, at the time of the Buddha, a stupa was actually a burial mound. So similar like in Europe, they had these burial mounds in a long time ago. Um, so this a stupa was actually at that time just a burial mound made from rammed earth. And that was before bricks were even used. And so that's why the Ramagama Stupa, it looks just like a seven meter high hill or a burial mound because it survived in its original state. And then later in centuries after the Buddha, and the building made, some buildings became, it became common for buildings to be made out of bricks. And then they expanded Stupas, similar like, say, the Sanchi Stupa, it's like a dome-like shape, and a little chatra, a parasol, a symbol of veneration and royalty on top of it. Maybe you know the Sanchi Stupas. And then, on the later, like for example, in Anuradhapura, or Svedegon Pagoda, then this chatra becomes more and more elaborate, and of more like, Pointy. Hmm. Yeah, but that's at least how the human super architecture developed over the centuries. But yeah, as I mentioned, since ancient times, it's reported that stupas are also visited by devas or by nagas, by divine beings. And so, as I mentioned before, the offerings of the devas and nagas to the stupa and surpass the offerings that even any human king or emperor could make. And so in the human realm, the Ramagama stupa is just a little hill, but maybe if you would have the divine eye, it would look very different, and maybe it would be one of the most impressive buildings in the world. <laughs> but that's just speculation, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, so what does the Buddha himself say about the significance of stupas? The Buddha only mentions it in very few discourses. It says that a, no, a Buddha or a noble disciple is worthy of a stupa. And so, yeah, the, maybe the, the purpose, if we see the stupa and remember the Buddha or a noble disciple, that their hearts get uplifted and gain confidence because they recollect the outstanding qualities of the Buddha, noble disciple, and are inspired by them. 
So yeah, Stupa is in a way an external focus for recollecting the Buddha and his noble disciples. And then it gives people the opportunity to express their respects to the Buddha or disciple even after they've passed away. And obviously one can practice recollection of the Buddha and noble disciples in any place, but uh, for most people it's easier if they more powerful if they do it in an inspiring place like a stupa or a holy site. They were, yeah, by recollecting the outstanding qualities of qualities of the Buddha, that is perfect in true knowledge and conduct, and the know of the world. That you can gain inspiration in the meaning and inspiration in the Dhamma. So in a sense, what does it mean to realize awakening or liberation? And how did the Buddha and his disciples live and practice? And then yeah, the Buddha says, then practicing this recollection that one gains yeah, joy or rapture. So he also says that practicing recollection of the mind develops more samadhi. So it's also a way of developing samadhi because then at that time the mind is just focused on the Buddha or the disciples of the Buddha and sort of the abandons distraction and becomes more unified in samadhi. <coughs> Also less non less affected by the five hindrances or desire, aversion and delusion, he says. And by recollecting the Buddha and disciples of the Buddha, you can also develop the five fa spiritual faculties like sadha, faith or confidence in the Buddha's awakening. And that what gives the recollection the power is understanding the meaning and significance of his awakening and his outstanding qualities. And the deeper you understand um, yeah, the qualities of the Buddha and the significance of his awakening, the more powerful will be the effect of the recollection. Yeah, and in the sense that the more, the more you understand why it is worthwhile to follow the teaching and put it into practice, the more you will apply your energy or effort, which is the second spiritual faculty. And then if you apply more effort, you develop more and more continuous mindfulness, sati. And if the mind stays in the four foundations of mindfulness, then the heart or the mind gets unified and develops samadhi and the unified mind, chitta or heart, sees things as they really are. And so in this way here, yeah, these five faculties can be developed. Yeah, so I had great mudita, so sympathetic joy that the people of this um, foundation, the architects of, have undertaken this task of developing this Rama Gama Stupa. Because I remember when I was there in Lumpini, that I thought, yeah, it would be great if it would become a nice holy site. And yeah, so it's the only original relic stupa of the Buddha that survived undisturbed. And so it's nice if it can be yeah, developed in a holy site. And so, yeah. And then can inspire many people to pay respects to the relics and recollect the Buddha and meditate and chant there. So it's a um, great thing to, to do that. <coughs> 